sort of Scottish, or the sort of Scottish, with uh, uh, it, it started originally in Mississauga, and uh, that was you know during the early part of the 1914 war, and they wanted to get into the battle. They thought that they had a good regiment, so uh, they. Uh, did the best thing they could, and that was move into Toronto. So they, we had a space there, uh, and, uh, and that was approximately 600 Lakeshore Road, and uh, a very good spot for a regiment. And they trained there, and most of the men that were uh, in the Toronto Scottish went overseas at that time because uh, they had their training. They had about, uh, oh, four to six months of solid training. And they were the first regiment that said, or they said, that the first to get overseas, and that was in 1939, on an early ship going overseas, and over to England, of course, we say overseas. and. Uh, they did well then. The 48th Highlanders said, we are an older regiment. You're, you are first div and we're first div. But on the other hand, we say that we're the older regiment because we were in the war before that. And uh, so we think we should be first div and you second div. Well, that didn't sit very well with Toronto Scottish. Not only that, because they figured they were the first to go overseas. But the 48th Highlanders said, no, we were the first to go over to England. So it's never been settled, as far as I know, who was the first. But the second battalion, which was Toronto Scottish, had, had to change and we had to buy our blue ribbon. So our guy said, no, sir, Ray, we're not dropping down to second choice. We're still first choice. No, you're not. So I'll tell you what, if we give you a golden arrow on your path, would you accept that? Yes, we will accept that. We so will be a golden arrow, boys. And this is continued to this day. We are Golden Arrow. And still uh, no objections by the higher ups. And therefore, that we are now complete. Toronto Scottish went overseas in 1939. They also, a few of them, went up the coast to record order and see what was going on. Well, we uh, actually, we had to do maneuvers because a regiment of people, of men, have to be entertained. And one way to do it is marching. We exercise and we were going up to heights of 12 feet. Some of the boys when they come down, sprained ankles. That's no good. So take that off. No more of that. So eventually, <coughs> it was <coughs> mostly marching. That was our exercise, a very good exercise on our feet. You see, my training really started at North Bay because we were sent to, on 7th of July, uh, to the North Bay to train. And uh, the training there was what we were going to have to use overseas. Now, they also trained us on some of the war equipment that was First World War. Not that it mattered very much, but we had our training. Uh, now, for uh, machine guns, it's 600 yards. You have a, a, a uh, the fair sits up there, and you point your, your gun there, 
and you know you should know how to operate it. You press the nose piece, and as we call it, and you press that, and then you get maybe 25 shots off at one time. Keep it down, you can run through the whole belt at 250 shells in the belt. Then you pick up another belt, <laughs> thread it in, and then we have a single shot, or, a, or more than a single shot, whatever the officer wants you to do. Now, in your single shot, uh, you have it set at 100 yards, two, <laughs> 200, 200 yards, and you see how you do with that. Uh, firing, then you also uh, have a grenade uh, called a 4.2 grenade. You have to take a course on that, how to throw it, and uh, when to throw it. And uh, uh, it, it is a 20 pound bomb, a very superior bomb because it can uh, do an enormous amount of damage. I went in with 2nd Div, and uh, we were second way over in D-Day. Uh, we couldn't send all on D-Day. Too many, too many soldiers. So we d divided up, and the 2nd Division, along with uh, those uh, with that, with second div, uh, as I was a driver on D-Day, and I also, uh, when we had to go over to France, I had to drive through London in the convoy, which was very nice, very easy, and Jerry, our opposition, had set up a flying bomb, now you call it, uh, the, over there they call it, they call it a fleet of the bomb, which is a flying bomb, and it has about a half ton uh, bomb in it, and a very destructive, it could even be a, a, a ton, which would be, could be 2,000 pounds, and it's known to destroy huge areas. Now that's was the first bomb that was propelled over to England. Well, after D-Day, of course, we didn't go over on D-Day. The third, Div <coughs> third Division went over on D-Day, and uh, uh, along with all the uh, other regiments, such as the uh, uh, United States, uh, there would be Polish and British regiments, and uh, we all went over together, and we had our particular uh, spot uh, where we were to land, and uh, we, uh, of course, when we went over, we went over a, a year or six, or one month later, and that one month, uh, was roughly 300 days, and the time was the 5th and 6th of uh, July, and we landed on shore. Now, as I mentioned before, I had to take the, the stuff all out of the car uh, after stuffing it up uh, for, for going through water. Uh, and then we arrived at our point at night, so I couldn't tell you much about it. But uh, we slept uh, beside, uh, uh, I didn't sleep too far from the paymaster. You see, I was very lucky. I was given the opportunity of driving the paymaster, which is a very important man because he has to take charge of the different troops coming in, those that are leaving, those that are, uh, I struck off strength and so on. So uh, it's a big job for him. And he was a very fine man. He was a captain. 
and apparently Captain uh, uh, especially this man, it was uh, very sincere, very quiet. So our mission was uh, uh, was was going to be in a succession, and as long as uh, we weren't wounded, shrapnel or whatever, uh, why we could keep on going. And our mission was uh, had to be to, to destroy the German lines and keep our lines in shape, which we did, and uh, we did destroy a, uh, now there was to be a, uh, something that was coming up. Uh, they had about 150,000 Germans all corralled in one area, and we were to try to take that 150,000 prisoners. That's a lot of prisoners. However, uh, and we uh, we were at a spot called IFS. We had during the day we had American airplanes covered. During the night we had British airplanes coming and Canadian covered our area. And these bombers, uh, uh, well, at night we wouldn't see them. In the daytime we would see them. And they did just as we generally expected. And then one afternoon, early after, very early afternoon, and as well as chefs came running back, they, they, they were killing, they were dropping bombs on the Polish and the British. They're over on, on our west flank. And they, we, we've got to get out of here. They're coming over this way. And by gosh, if they didn't come over our way. And so I thought first of my vehicle, naturally, it's important. And I thought, well, I can't stop for it. This is coming, it's too serious. When you see the bombs coming down towards the ground, and tumbling as you see them in the picture show, it's just the same thing. They do, I see. And he's. Uh, let's see, no, he wasn't too hard to say, but he, he was the, the major of B Company, and this major of B Company, he said, I give you the authority to get out of here. We are being rained on by bombs. And so I did, I, I ran along with the rest of them, and we jumped off the edge down onto the road and scared scattered up the road and for about two miles. And then we figured we were far enough away, so uh, we're not going to be armed here. So we stopped and, <clears throat> and finally returned. Thank goodness my vehicle with all the paste papers in there was intact. So I picked up pay and the sergeant and uh, we uh, we went back to camp, and uh, it was a uh, uh, what happened was the uh, Amer Americans bombed the wrong vehicle and put themselves out out of the contact that they were supposed to make. So, however, I don't know anything more than that. We were. We're not told too much in the army, and uh, the officers might know, but they don't. They don't talk unless the, unless it's very necessary. But everything in the war is a secret, and uh, because it just has to be. Let's see what else. Oh yes, we had night schemes, and our night schemes we had an officer uh, that was training him for night work. <coughs> now we had to go over to another area and capture that area. That was our duty that night, was to capture those boys. Uh, they were supposed to be Germans, and so we set off to do this very thing. That we got partly over there, and to, 
we were doing a very best and uh, the officer came and spoke to us and made some certain suggestions and, and we carried out and so when we got there again we had captured these men and we we were but there was what they call the fifth column. Now, what exactly this fifth column was to do, I never really could discover what it was. But anyway, towards the end of this thing, who should it be? The fifth column was the officer in charge of our group. So he was not giving us the right things at all. He was giving us something else, but we had to do what he said, and of course we, it was the wrong thing, but we, we uh, afterwards it was all over. Nothing was ever really said about it, but that was that we were the fifth column, and uh, we might say, well, what on earth was the fifth column? Well, to tell you, I was as good as who, I can't tell you either, and I don't think the officers could tell you. I think it was just something that they made up. Anyway, we had fun. But anyway, the regiment was always considered a top-notch regiment. These fellows had picked themselves to do what they were to do, and therefore they wanted to be first class, second for nothing, for no second class. So we carried on, and we used the word carry on, because there was a, an army officer, very well thought of, and he was dying, and they knew that he couldn't help him. So he said, boys, carry on. So when we signed our papers, we signed carry on in his name. You know, we don't use his name, but uh, there you have that part of it. I feel good, but I feel that they are exceptional men.